You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. It's the Neverland Podcast, episode 116. Welcome to Neverland. Take a start of the right and stay until morning. Neverland. Good morning, Neverland! All right, take your pixie out of your pocket, get some of that pixie dust, and sprinkle yourself with it from that there pixie, because it's time to fly to Neverland, and I, of course, am your host, the Spider Pan, Jeremy, and with me again... Heather, the Wendy Nerd. Yes, we are here again, and we've got so much stuff to put in here that... Let's see, we've got a visit to the trailer park, we've got some Neverland story time, we've got some audio from the from Disneyland that Lost Boy Eric has brought us, and then I have a wonderful conversation with Dale Wentland from the D-Cast. We might as well just get started right on here with a visit to the trailer park. Mama, now the gator got in the house. Now the gator? Give me that sugar. Come here. Oh, oh, get him, Mama. Oh, get that gator. Oh, oh. The Neverland trailer park. <laughs> Morning! <laughs> I can't! <laughs> You're the sweetest boy in Fairville. Morning, Pee Wee! Morning, Pee Wee! Don't you ever wonder what life is like outside Fairville? Nope. You know I don't want to go anywhere or try anything new. Bye! <laughs> French toast is up! <laughs> cool. We're gonna get you. Milkshake, please. Flavor? Let's say chocolate. Three, two, one, chocolate. Wow. Thanks. You ever been in a fight? No. Broken a rule? No. You ever had two women fight over you? Uh, have I? No. <sighs> I think I know why you and I met. You're gonna leave Fairville. You're gonna take a holiday. You got a choice to make. Stick around here. I live a little. Bingo! <laughs> My very first holiday is off to a perfect start! <laughs> you jackers, where are you headed? Drive, pipsqueak. <laughs> Come on, let me go. <laughs> where are we? The woods. New York City. Our village. A snake farm. Ah! Uh. Oh, you coming with us. This your lucky day. <laughs> Where should I sit? By me. <laughs> Ow! Ow! <laughs> Say a few words, Billy. Uh, encyclopedia, pimple, and uh, hairball. Hey, man. L a t t i h t b d. Look at the time. I have to be going. Okay, now this is different because this is not actually going to be in theaters. Yeah, and yeah. Yes. Looking, yeah. <laughs> Looking at me doesn't translate onto a podcast. No, but this will be on Netflix March 18th. This is Pee-wee's big holiday. And you can't really call any of these Pee-wee Herman's movies sequels because really Big Top Pee-wee is separate from uh, 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 Pee-wee's Big Adventure. And really with this, the way they're presenting it, you know, like Pee-wee has never left his town, never been in a fight. And uh, when this was – when uh, Pee-wee himself, you know, well, you know, Paul Rubens posted this to Facebook on the official Pee-wee fan page, somebody who hadn't mentioned it's like, well, Pee-wee got in a fight with Francis. But, okay, you have to rule that out. That didn't actually happen because also in Pee-wee's Big Adventure, he did leave his hometown and went across the America. So this is this is almost like – Finding a new way to do a similar movie with Pee Wee just going across America and having fun, different adventures and different situations. Yep. I agree. I had nothing more to add. Nope. Wow. Okay. Well, well I never saw Big Top Pee Wee. Well, that doesn't matter. I've seen Pee Wee's Big Adventure, though. Yeah. 
Well, so that but rating on this trailer though. Yeah, it's it's kind of the same story, like you said, where he gets, he leaves and is thrown into some uh, odd situations, and uh, looks like the the according to the trailer, uh, the first thing is he's getting carjacked. Yes, by a bunch of people robbing a bank, a bunch of women. And it just kind of seems like it goes downhill from there, and they, yeah. you know, several different things that they throw in there, and that he's, you know, different kinds of people that he fell in with, and yeah, and he always falls in with like some crazy people that you think he might be in trouble, but they end up really liking him, and then mm-hmm. they'll probably all show up in the end to help him out with whatever, you know, because there's probably after what something that you know, other than meeting the the guy on the motorcycle, which I swear he looks so familiar, I'm gonna have to look up who that guy is. Yeah, he did look familiar. I cannot think where I've pictured him. He almost reminds me of the guy that was in Arrow that played Deathstroke, but. Not quite. I don't know if that's him or not. I don't know. He does remind they, they me. They grizzled of him. him all up, so it's kind of hard yeah, to see like, what's really his face and what's you know. I mean, he's the biker, so yeah. you know. But I'm kind of thinking, you know, he gets slightly inspired to take a trip from that guy. But you know, I, I'm kind of wondering if there's something else he decides he wants to do because he's headed for the Big Apple, according to the sticker on his back of his car. Yeah. I wonder if there's something he finds out that he really wants to go and do, and he finds the excuse to finally leave. It's probably something silly like the Big Apple is like really a Big Apple or something like he wants to go see. I mean, because that, that sounds very Pee Wee-ish. Let's that go see, would be. He wants you know, to actually find the world's biggest apple or something. Yeah, or something like that. I that mean, sounds more like Weird Al Yankovic with the biggest bottle of yarn in Minnesota. Well, I mean, it wasn't in um, Pee Wee's Big Adventure he wanted to go to the or Alamo or something like yeah, that? Yeah, well, no, he was looking for his bike. Oh, that's what it was. At the yes, Alamo. yes okay. I'm pretty sure no one's going to steal his bike this time. No, because I don't even see him having a bike. Like he had yeah. his little car. His and little then... car, a very Mr. Bean kind of car. Yes, <laughs> I got to say it does remind me a little bit of a, you know a Mr. Bean's holiday sort of mm-hmm. thing. Uh, where he's just going to end up going into all various situations, and him being Pee Wee, you're just going to see, you know, how he responds to all these different things. Living you know, with Amish people, he's going to fall in with some guy out in the wilderness, and there's an old lady on a skateboard. Oh, well, I think that's in town in Fairview because you see her before. It's, oh, you're just the sweetest, nice in person oh, okay, in town. Well. So. You know, we'll we'll have some fun, I'm sure, in town mm-hmm. uh, before he gets out onto the road and has all these fun interactions. And you know, it would be fun if there's a few throwbacks to Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Maybe he runs yeah. into Large Marge again, or was that who it was on the truck? Yeah, get some platform shoes. Or... Get some, pla- you know, some little throwbacks. Maybe yeah. at one point have him on the bicycle just for fun, because yeah. it looks like they really are trying to remind everybody of how much fun uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure is, mm-hmm. and saying, "Well, here's a similar type of thing." And people are seem to be getting really excited about this because uh, he's he's in his sixties, I believe now. And you can kind of tell. You can you can kind of tell he's you know he can still pull off and everything, and he mm-hmm. doesn't seem like he's aged a whole lot, but that's mm-hmm. a lot of makeup. So yes. <laughs> Yes, that's when you realize he's always had a lot of makeup on to make it. Yeah, to, very, for Pee Wee. Yes, for, so. for Pee Wee's character. But overall, very exciting. Looks like a lot of fun. This will not, like I said, be in theaters. This will be on Netflix. And though it's not a Disney movie, but it is Disney kind of fun, right? Yes. We think so. I think Pee Wee could make a Disney movie if he wanted to. Probably. So, I think he's probably voiced some characters if I looked it up. I bet he has, but I don't oh, know I'm for sure. sure he has. He probably has. He's done a lot of uh, little things since... You know yeah. the Pee Wee days that we remember a long time ago. Yeah, that were just little things here and there, and, and, and appearing as Paul Rubens. You know there was being mm-hmm. the spleen, but uh, but that's what mm-hmm. overall what we think of this trailer. And uh, now I think it's time for a story. This is your Neverland story time. You can listen along with your MP3 device. You will know it is time to listen when you hear the chime like this. Let's begin now. This is a Disneyland original little long playing record. And I am your story reader. I am going to begin now to read the story of Bedknobs and Broomsticks. You can read along with me in your book. You will know it is time to turn the page when Tinkerbell rings her little bells like this. Let's begin now. Eglantine Price was a most unusual lady. She lived in an old house overlooking the English Channel. Carrie Charles and Paul Rawlins, sent to board with her during the Second World War, weren't sure they wanted to stay. <coughs> Miss Price had a strange hobby. She was taking lessons by mail on how to be a witch, hoping she could help England with her magic. The day the children arrived, she received her broomstick in the mail. Deciding to leave, The children were climbing out a second-story window when Miss Price came flying out of the house on her broomstick. It was a short ride. 
she landed with a crash. The next morning, Miss Price gave the children a magic bed knob. You turned it on the bedpost, said some special words, and the bed would take you where you wanted to go. When the last of the lessons on substitutionary locomotion did not come in the mail, Miss Price decided to go to London and ask her teacher, Amelius Brown, what had happened. Everyone climbed on the bed. The magic words were said, and they were on their way. They found Amelius Brown selling magic tricks, horns, and whistles. He told Miss Price he hadn't sent the last lesson because he didn't have it. Filigree, apogee, pedigree, perigree, said Miss Price. Professor Brown turned into a white rabbit. After she had changed him back, Amelius told Miss Price he had gotten the magic words from an old book in his house on the other side of London. He was surprised to find the spells worked, and decided Miss Price must have some special powers. Using the travelling spell, they were soon airborne again, high over the roofs of London. The bed came to rest in front of Amelia's fine old abandoned townhouse. While he and Miss Price talked, the children explored. In the nursery, they found a crumpled linen book called the Isle of Nabumbu. It had pictures of animals dressed like people. Then Amelius found the volume he was looking for. It was called the Spell of Astaroth. Several pages were missing, pages which contained the magic words Miss Price needed. The trail led to a bookstore on Portobello Road. The bookman had the missing pages, which said the words were engraved on a jewel, and that the jewel was on the Isle of Nabumbu. When the bookman found Paul had a book about Nabumbu, he tried to get it away from him. Just in time, they all climbed on the bed and took off for the island. Instead of landing on Nabumbu itself, the bed came down in a lagoon. And promptly sank to the bottom. A large bear, who happened to be fishing, pulled it out. He was about to throw everybody back in, but Paul demanded to see the king. The king had his own problems. His favourite soccer game was being postponed for lack of a referee, so Emilius volunteered. Many kinds of animals were playing. A hippo, a kangaroo, a cheetah, an ostrich, and an elephant made up the blue team. The king's team, the dirty yellows, included a rhino, a crocodile, a hyena, a warthog, and a gorilla. Luckily, the king's team won. Emilius got the magic jewel, but lost it on the way home. Then Miss Price found that the words she needed had been in Paul's book all along. She tried them first on Amelius's shoes, then Charlie's trousers, then her father's sword, and it worked. They came to life. Feeling his work was done, Emilius set off for the railroad station, only to find that it would be hours before the next train. <coughs> Returning to the house, he discovered that Miss Price and the children had been captured by enemy soldiers and taken to an old museum. He changed himself into a rabbit, with some difficulty, and followed. By the time he arrived at the museum, the spell had worn off. Miss Price told him some commandos were attacking the English coast. Looking at the armor in the museum, Emilia thought of a way to drive them off. They would use substitutionary locomotion. Miss Price said the magic words. Flags fluttered, drums began to beat, and trumpets played. The suits of armor came to life. Mounting her broomstick, Miss Price led her army forth. 
What a sight they made! The enemy fled in terror, and Miss Price had done her bit to save England. Cosmic wizards of timeless times, teach my tongue the transcendental rhymes. Help my mind to find the skill. Give my heart the fervent will to summon. Substitute every locomotion, mystic power that's far beyond the wildest notion. It's so weird, so feared, yet wonderful to see. Substitute every locomotion, come to me. I don't want low commotion. Every substitution or remote. In transitory convolution, only one precise solution is the key. Substitutionary locomotion, it must be substitutionary locomotion can create a state of clamorous commotion. It's the spell to quell invasion from the sea. Substitutionary locomotion is the key, the key to guide the tide that's stronger than the ocean. I want substitutionary locomotion. It can cause the force to keep our country free. Substitutionary locomotion work for me. Okay, 
Now, uh, we're going to have a special guest here, Mr. Dale Wentlin from the D-Cast. Uh, we did record this before the Deadpool movie comes out, so I did want to kind of make you aware that we are going to mention he does ask me if I'm planning to see the Deadpool movie, and uh, I was a little bit undecided. I figured I was probably going to see it, uh, but I figured I'd go ahead and bring that up. That way you know that, yes, this is not quite exactly current and if you wanted to see my review of the deadpool film uh, it, it is at the news.neverlandpodcast.com or if you go to neverlandpodcast.com and click on the news uh thing there on the menu you will be able to of course find our news page there's been some other articles since my review of deadpool but you could track it down there if you are so inclined but now without further ado uh, let's hear what has been previously recorded to disney and beyond <laughs> All right, Neverlanders, it's time to further your education of the Marvel Universe, as well as the DC Universe, as we jump back into class. But this time, we've brought in somebody from the D-Cast. If you have not been listening to the D-Cast, I've mentioned them before, but we've brought... Now, I've got a theory on the D-Cast. The D-Cast <laughs> is a D, not for Disney. No, it is the Dale cast. So so we have Dale that came in. Dale Wentland, welcome to Neverland. Hey, thanks for having me. But see, I'm right, isn't it? It's the Dale cast. No, it really isn't. Andy is the creator of the D cast, and I uh, joined him, and uh, then we became partners. Uh, but you know it's the Dale cast. It was meant for you. <laughs> it, Andy knew you were coming. <laughs> he must have. He must have known. He must have known. <laughs> But uh, I thought it would be fun and interesting because you love to do like a lot of movie stuff and you have some fun movie theories and stuff. Yeah. So we're going to talk some of these movies that have come throughout history uh, with, uh, with DC and Marvel and how they've kind of been in competition throughout on television and in movies and, you know, look into the future of what's coming. A lot of exciting things to get into. Uh, but some of the earliest things that I know of that were created were these serials. That, uh, you know, these were done back in the movie theaters. You know, you'd go Saturday morning, you pay your nickel, and you could just sit in there and watch these. And they had a black and white Batman serial. And I think you had mentioned before, you have actually never seen any of these. No, I know they exist, but, uh, yeah, no, I haven't seen them. Oh, believe Because they came out on DVD anything. back in the day. Yeah, yeah. I actually found those in the in a public library, and I checked them out thinking, wow, this is kind of neat. And I started watching, and I'm like, wow, this is <laughs> kind of boring. Yeah. Well, just the, the way the storytelling is like, even nowadays, I find that some people think like, um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, that the, a lot of the people that I try to show that, show that to haven't seen that or they've seen the other Indiana Jones movies, they think that is a slow episode, even though it's my favorite. Oh, yeah. And, I love that um, yeah, you know, so I, I think it's just a different style of filmmaking. Yeah, and I think because they were trying to stretch a story out uh, over several, you know, episodes. Uh but it's it was it's a very different style of Batman from back then. He you know, the Batmobile was pretty much like a, this just a sedan, you know. <laughs> they were yeah, driving yeah, a normal yeah. car. So yeah, like a black car, but yeah. all the cars were black, so. <laughs> yeah. Or they were sometimes white. Yeah. But that's it. <laughs> And then you had a really terrible costume and the, the bad ears were kind of crooked and weird, look like weird stuffed pillows somebody stuck on somebody's head. But it was a start and it was really, I think, breaking the ground to bring comic book characters into the cinema and also on eventually on television. So you got to give DC some credit for getting that started because I, I think they were probably more well known at the time, you know, for bringing Superman to television with George Reeves. Have you seen yeah. any of those? Well, I've seen bits and pieces of them, yeah. But, you know, I was born in 1985, so... Oh, you're uh, a youngin'. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, like, I've seen them, and I, I've watched, uh, like, bits and pieces. I used to watch the Batman TV show a lot when I was a kid. Yeah, there um, we go. But, yeah, George Reeves is even too far back for me. <laughs> That's too, bar too far back for me, really. But I, I remember Nick and Knight, when they started showing it, I would try to watch them. And it... it, it, it I appreciate the effort they put into the costume, but it looked like he was wearing a pair of uh, thin sweats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they'd have like a thin paper wall and he'd jump through it and get into those hands in his hip, that Superman pose that the bad guys would shoot and they would have these little uh, sparks that they would kind of draw on him and everything's like, bing, 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 you know, and, and then he would duck when the gun was thrown at him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but, but it's still. Because the gun was a real prop and he couldn't right, get hit by it. Right. <laughs> 
But once again, you know, it's bringing superheroes to TV. And, uh, you know, Shazam eventually even had a a television show, I guess, at some point, which, well, of course, I think he was known as Captain Marvel at the time, but he got well known as Shazam. And he wasn't quite part of the DC universe, was then brought in. But as you had mentioned now, the the one that I remember seeing, because they put it on syndication, I remember here in Kansas City, which you're way up there in Canada. Um, they started like not actually up, but yeah. Well, north. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they started we, showing. Uh, let's see, He Man was at four thirty in the afternoon, and then at five o'clock, Batman would come on. And they actually made us wait with the '60s series. They would actually have one episode, you know, because now if you catch it on TV, they're going to show a back-to-back episode, so you get to see both parts. But we actually had to wait till the following day. And if you went till Friday and you had the cliffhanger episode on Friday, you had to wait until Monday to see how Batman was going to get out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my my big introduction into Batman was the Tim Burton uh, movies, and then the animated series that followed. Oh yes. Which we'll catch up to that. We got a long way to go. <laughs> so, but you have seen at least some of the sixties Batman, I guess. Then later on, right? Oh yeah, like every everything and all in the movie. Oh yes, we actually watched that in my middle school. Uh, we used to uh, when, when we would be going on like Christmas vacation or or spring break or whatever, they would bring a an old film strip movie, and we'd all go into the auditorium and watch it. And that was actually one of the films we got to watch was the old Batman movie. Which, oh, wow. Yeah, this was around in 89, so you had like the Tim Burton was popular, the Tim Burton one, and then they bring in this one because they thought, well, we can show them this, and it was kid-friendly enough. Although we got middle schoolers, and anytime he started kissing on uh, Lee Merriweather, was, I believe was Catwoman in that yes, one? Yes, yeah, she's so beautiful in the movie. Oh, yeah. With yeah. Everybody was going, woo, whatever, they start kissing or something. <laughs> yes, we were real mature in, in middle school, we are. <laughs> but uh, that was actually the Batman I grew up watching. That and uh, have you ever seen any of the old Super Friends cartoons? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> I was about to say you're going to make me feel old if you've never even seen those. <laughs> well, I've seen them, like you know, but uh, the Cartoon Network um, or Teletoon actually from us up here, uh, they they would play them with uh, the the Spider Man uh, cartoon as well. Which that Spider Man cartoon is a disaster. Which like one? The the um you know, the original Spider Man cartoon, the Spider Man, Spider Man. Oh the sixties. Uh, Spider Man. Because like the amount of um backgrounds that they reused oh, yeah. for any one shot was just like it must have taken them, you know, days and days to make the backgrounds and then they just must have taken 10 minutes to make an episode because like they just threw those backgrounds repeated like when he was swinging there was three motions like there's only three animations of him swinging and then it's just a different background that's repeated <laughs> yeah i couldn't help but love it though because i'm a huge spider-man junkie so it's it was still fun to watch as bad as it was oh yeah i still watched it yep <laughs> uh the, also at the time marvel had those uh I think they had an entire like hour program or something because I found like the uh, theme songs for you know the Marvel superheroes have arrived, uh, and it had like a Captain America, a Thor, a Submariner, and a Hulk short cartoon. And golly, I don't remember how long it must have been in the '90s. I started finding on video at the library they had some of these cartoons, and this is where it was like they would draw. Or take a frame from a comic book, and then one part would move, like the arm might lift. Yeah. But otherwise, it's like freeze frames, and then to have dialogue in the mouth might be moving to the dialogue. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's come a long way. I still think comic books uh, on television are not very good, though. Really? Yeah, I don't think they've ever done it properly. Wow. Okay, we're going to get to that, because I don't want to hear your thoughts on that, but uh, we got to work our way up. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, yeah, so the Super Friends, uh, you know, b- between... The 60s Batman that I was watching, the live action, and the Superfans version of Batman, uh, I will say when it got to the 1989 and I, and I saw the first commercials on television for the Tim Burton Batman, I was completely thrown. This was Batman as I had never seen him and I didn't even recognize it and I was like, what is that? Had you never read The Dark Knight Returns? No, I was more of a, a Marvel type of guy. Oh. And a lot of my, when I was a kid, a lot of my comic reading was I had to borrow it from somebody. For sure. 
Yep. Or find it in a forest. Or find it in a forest. I mean, now you got it easy. You can go to the library if you want to go and get a collection of things. You can read up and catch up on things. Uh, but I think I mainly – because I, I did love Batman after the 89 movie. But uh, I had started a lot with Marvel because uh, this is also going to be probably a bit before your time. But uh, a Saturday morning cartoons that we had a Spider-Man and his amazing friends, which I just absolutely loved it. And I still love to watch it. It's really bad, but I still yeah. love watching it. Oh, that's good. It was good. Yeah, it was a pretty good show. Uh, and then about a season or so into that, and before that, there had been a Spider-Man cartoon, which I didn't know about until it was on Netflix for a little while. Uh, but they had an Incredible Hulk cartoon, which this yes. was this was different from me. Yeah, it was <laughs> terrible. <laughs> well, see, the, the weird thing Dr. is... Dr. Bruce Banner, pelted by gamma rays, now he turned into the Hulk, isn't he gamma rays? Yeah. That doesn't yeah. even make sense. <laughs> That's from the 60s one, though. This is in the 80s. Oh, the 80s. Yes, the okay, 80s yeah. had an Incredible Hulk cartoon, which was weird for me because I remember when I was a little kid, uh, and this is probably still before your time, but uh, they had – I loved the Dukes of Hazard as a kid. Loved Dukes of Hazard. Yeah, it was great. I loved it. I didn't understand it. I just – cars and jumping. Woo! You know. Yeah. But, but in order to watch Dukes of Hazard, the Incredible Hulk came on first on CBS. Yeah. And my family would want to watch The Incredible Hulk, but it scared the bejeebers out of me. <laughs> and it was in the cartoon or the no, live action? This is a live action Lou Ferrigno. Incredible yeah, the Hulk. Lou Ferrigno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, again, you know, that, yeah. It, <laughs> we're, it's, they're starting to get better around that time, but still, there's just like a total misunderstanding of the characters and what they're supposed to be in the metaphor. Yeah. Like, I, I just think. Um, all meta, like I, I still, I had to suffer, like I suffered through Smallville as a teenager and I love, like, I love like Superman is my guy and was my guy for a really long time. But, uh, that's like, and anyone who likes talks about arrow and I've watched arrow and it's Smallville. Like all the CW stuff is Smallville. It's the same format. They do the monster of the week episodes and they do. And it's like the, um, you have like a, Hey, there's that popular like movie style now out or that there's like a really popular show. We'll do an episode like that show. And it's, it's just so like formulaic and I, and it, 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 the, it's continuity is such a mess. Like the thing about comic books that are good in their own contained continuity storylines. And yes, they have to reboot them all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, is, is the arc in itself and the, the build up towards something and the intrigue. There's always intrigue in comic books. There's always yeah. like a mystery and ah, it just doesn't translate into television or they haven't done it properly or they like do things like X-Men. X-Men is a X-Men. Like when the first X-Men movie came out, it came out. Everyone was like, Oh, that was like, this is the best we ever seen. And it was the best we ever seen, but it's not a very good movie. Yeah. And, and the thing is, X Men doesn't work as a movie. X Men works as a television show. It's an ensemble. It's just like it's a. You, you, there's so many characters, but the mm-hmm. you have to have those characters to make it uh, to make it the X Men. Otherwise, you make a series of Wolverine movies with occasional other mutants. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, and that's the, the that's the thing. Uh, I think I think. Man of Steel in a lot of ways got Superman almost the way he's supposed to be. But then the Lex Luthor that they have, like not the actor, but I can just tell like the way they're portraying him, they might show me wrong, but you, the best Lex Luthor is supposed to be the Lex Luthor you agree with to the very end. You're like, Oh, he has a really good point there. There, you know, we are destroying the earth. Like that's that, that would be his angle. Now we're destroying the earth. You know, like humans are destroying the earth. We have to, we can't have, we're waiting for something to come save us. And Superman is a symbol of, symbolism of that wanting us to, uh, someone else to come save us. We need to save the earth. We need to do this. And you're like, oh, I agree with Lex Luthor. I agree with Lex Luthor. Luther. And then you're like, what's his, like, well, what's he going to do? And then it's always like, so what I plan is we kill two thirds of the world's humans. And you're like, ah, that's not a good idea. <laughs> you know, like that is, uh, that's your Lex Luthor. But they never, they always, like in the movies, um, with Christopher Reeves, he was a realist. Like it was real estate scams. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was all real estate scams. And then Superman Returns, it was another real estate scam. Yeah. Real estate scam. And then you know, so 
Yeah, they just don't get it yeah. right. They just they 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 make the char- they make the characters whatever they want to make them, and and um, they just don't translate it properly. Yeah, and that's one of the things that's been weird. It's like okay, you know, DC has had whatever this deal is with Warner Brothers for so long. And they made, and st- I still love the old Christopher Reeve Superman movies. I mean, I, even though you know they, they did have a weird Lex Luthor, but Gene Hackman was incredibly entertaining as their version of a Lex Luthor, even if it was really off. I think they were afraid back then to really step up. I don't know if they thought audience would really have taken to the Lex Luthor that had this obsession with destroying Superman because, and I, at least they did have the line of, you know, that, you know, he's like this God that doesn't share his power with the rest of us and stuff like that. You know, that there's like a jealousy that Lex Luthor kind of has. Yeah. No. And they, and they, they, they've started to introduce that into him, yeah. but it, it's not even like a jealousy. It's a fear. It's like, um, Superman will make humans not become better. And that's what Lex Luthor is afraid about. Mm. You know, that's what he's afraid of. He's afraid of p- the superheroes making humans feel less when humans should, f- should, if they fight for themselves or if they do it themselves, will become better. He has a noble cause. He just is a psycho. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like well, psycho is a word used he's, he's from not little like minds. I don't understand. <laughs> he's not like the Joker. The Joker has chaotic, a chaotic cause. He's oh, not. Yeah. He's not doing their. He doesn't believe himself to truly be the good guy. Um, but Lex Luthor does, and th- there should be a, an aspect of us that agrees with him uh, and sympathizes with that plight and, and, and put ourselves in that shoes. If there was Superman that showed up all of a sudden uh, in our world. It would, yeah. People would be so resistant to it, but it would represent a lot of different things, and that it's supposed to be a metaphor, and they just don't, they don't play it as a metaphor enough. Like they, they, they play it as like a real story, like a, like it, you know, like they play it like it's about, they play it like it's about a superhero fighting bad guys. Mm, yeah, and it isn't. The the. the, the like the only things that like the only things that ever come close to represent representing the comics are the animated mo- like cartoons the oh yeah the DC animated movies are fantastic um Batman the animated series um Batman Beyond you know the Justice League uh Justice League Unlimited Young Justice uh Marvel has not been very good like X Men was okay, it was good in the day, but if you watch it again, it's not. It's the animated. The animated series from the nineties. Yeah, yeah. X Men, like it's a good one. It's a good cartoon. It's and very stuff. good. I loved it. Yeah. No, I know uh, loving it and it being good or holding up <laughs> to time are two different things, right? I loved it as well, and I've watched it again recently and loved it. But you know, it again, it wasn't. Uh, the animation is not that great often. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Until oh golly, what was it about? Uh, I think it was around about the third season that you suddenly they wanted to show one in prime time, and it was uh, Wolverine and Jubilee, and I think Gambit going down into the sewers uh, where they had Lady Deathstrike. Yeah, yeah. Like suddenly we had a really good animation for like a couple episodes. Episodes, yeah. That was yeah. I remember and that. Then it just kind of went back to its normal. <laughs> but yeah, but even then, like their their far away shots, people have like weird gray, like fully gray square legs and stuff like that. <laughs> but I just don't know what it is about why it has to be a cartoon for the story to be similar to a comic book. Um, well, I, I think it comes back to having the courage to completely tell the story. And I think that's where the game has really changed because when you look at the past Marvel attempts at, at well, at television, you know, you watch the old um, Incredible Hulk television series. And you watch it now, and he's really not that incredible. He's not bulletproof for one, and you know he he does some pretty good feats of strength, but nowhere near the level of what Hulk is supposed to be capable of. And then if you see the old, there was a, a live action Spider Man series that it took him forever to climb a wall. He might. Oh yeah, that thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, was, and then they, then you see the old Captain America they tried to do where he's got a big motorcycle helmet and tights and a, oh it was so bad. That '90s Spider-Man cartoon was really good. Yes, oh I love that one. And that and like quality wise, that was more consistent and better than X-Men. Like just for the level of quality. Yeah, um, especially once again the pilot episode. If you look at that, the animation is so smooth and so yeah. tight. And then you get when they you know they get to the regular series, like the animation kind of fell off a little bit, but it was still good. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I think with movies, how they, they were afraid to take the risk. Because you watch, you know, The Incredible Hulk 
television series or the old Spider-Man television, uh, they never fought any of the supervillains. And no. it seems like it, Marvel didn't really take that first step until, well, I mean, granted, you have Spider-Man, but it almost was that formula of comic book movies that, oh, well, the villain will, will die by the end of the movie. You know, we don't keep villains around. Well, but and the great thing about the 90s got, cartoons, the, sorry, just the great thing about the 90s cartoons was they based all their episodes off of story arcs in the comic books. Yes. And like, so it would be like a six part, you know, which made it impossible to watch in those days. Cause you're like, Oh, I haven't seen part three yet or whatever. Right. <laughs> and it's part nine for some reason. Yeah. And uh, I, I but think that's what the made X-Men them good. series. They actually yeah. had a couple episodes that actually got Phoenix. flopped out of order in the first season. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think the movies have gone, got like in a lot of ways, the movies are almost starting to get better than the comic books. Yeah. See, cause I, I think they finally mainly when it, when it hit to the Avengers, they they went ahead and said, you know what? Aliens. We don't care. Aliens are going to come down and invade New York, and we're going to make it work. Yeah. Well, that's what happens. That that's that's exactly they haven't got it all right. But brought to life, and it finally it's opened the floodgates of saying, hey, you know what? We can do some of these over the top and big stories, and have it actually mean something. And I think that's exactly why they finally got the courage to do something off the wall like Guardians of the Galaxy, and found a way to make it work where everybody was going to love it because it's relatable, even if it's kind of that silly nonsense. You know, you got a talking tree that can only say, "I am Groot." Well, Gu- Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, I don't really class it as a comic book movie. In like the comic book is the source material, mm-hmm. but that's like saying the Fountain is the comic book movie. You know, um, just because the original source was a comic book, I think that when we talk about comic book movies, we specifically are talking about superhero. And I, I just feel. One like okay, I think that Marvel did it perfectly up until Ultron two, or sorry, Ultron well, because Age of Ultron. That movie is not good. Really, and, I liked it. Well, I'll tell you why it you're wasn't wrong. As good as the first one. That's <laughs> I'll sure. tell you. I'll tell you what's wrong about it. Is is first off the best fight in the in the in the whole thing happens in the halfway mark, Hulk versus Iron Man. So <laughs> the whole thing is a downhill from there. Ultron. You know, Ultron was just such a poorly executed villain that Ultron, like, it needed to be something that Tony Stark had been working on that they hinted at earlier on. But it, but because they shoehorned in the villain, uh, it, they couldn't do that. The the like another huge problem is th- what was great about the Avengers is it was a bunch of individual movies leading up to one big movie. Avengers 2 is a movie that is setting up other movies, which is a terrible, terrible thing to do. And we're going to find out that DC might do a better version of it, but it is a bad idea. Because when you have Captain America, you give Captain America character and development. When you have Captain America in the Avengers, he has to compete with everybody else. And But if you have those movies leading up and then have them in the Avengers... You, it's okay. You forego need, need of character development because it's all about a big fight scene and a big battle, which should have been leading up the whole time. The problem with Avengers is that it's self-contained, Avengers 2, it's self-contained because it's leading into other movies, which hopefully will pay off in the end. But it, like, why does the Hulk jump into the, o- like, put himself in a thing in the ocean when you could have had him trying to stop the land from falling out of the sky and under like under all the weight and he's just like screaming getting crushed under it and he slows it down enough where it doesn't destroy everything around it but that he gets like lost and and killed or whatever and we don't know what happens to him you have the exact same end moment that you want with um a shoehorned relationship of Scarlett Johansson and uh, Black Widow and um the Hulk and th- you then, but he also is a hero. He has a heroic moment, which yeah. is the Hulk is, 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 that's what the Hulk does. That's a Hulk. I don't know how they didn't see a, 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 a chunk of land in the sky, not the perfect Hulk moment. And, and, and it, and it bothers me. It bothers me to the point that it, they, these little subtle changes in that movie, they could have made, they could have made actual character development and it could have made sense. Like the Hulk doing what he did made no sense. And it was just, it, it added on time into the movie and it was just, it was just lazy that because it wasn't part of their focus. Say. Yeah. Well, cause it, 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 you get the same result at the yeah. end, but he's a hero. 
Yeah, he gets and, to go, go out big. Because as it was, it was more, I've got to leave because I've seen how dangerous I can be. And it, you're sure. still playing in that fear of, yeah. of, of of the Hulk being like he's afraid he's going to hurt somebody. Yeah, you get zero character development. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's the thing is Planet Hulk, I think, is will be a fantastic movie. But that whole movie is based on that. You know, like he's smarter when he's on Planet Hulk. And the basically the Avengers, the Illuminati, really, but it, it consists of most of the Avengers people. Um, yeah. They sent him. They sent Hulk away because they're tired of dealing with him. And he, you know, he's on this planet, and it it's basically John Carter of Mars. Um, yeah, I, I think I saw the animated version of Planet Hulk. I, I don't know how true the it's animated. The it, comic it's, story. it's pretty much the same, except for the planet blows up. Ah. And and it, then it's Hulk just jumping towards like this or to, back to Earth as the planet blows up. Because <laughs> oh comic books are better that way. Yeah. They're like, yeah, just blow it up. We'll retcon it later. That is something I would like to see them work on because you know I got used to when I started actually looking at the Hulk popping up in various different comics. He had kind of merged more you know he'd had he'd had his gray hulk period where he was more intelligent and then he'd become a green hulk where he really didn't ever change back to bruce but he was an intelligent hulk and he could hold a full conversation and he still had bruce Banner's brains kind of yes and, and that's and that's what you need because yeah like you can't have a story about bruce banner because bruce banner is supposed to be the most boring guy in the world. <laughs> right. Right? Like, that's his, that's the shtick. Like, that's why the first Hulk movie didn't work, because it did focus on Bruce Banner, and it was like, hey, this is boring, because he's boring. That's the point. The point, right? Like, and the thing with Hulk is that he's never, like, he, it, he's infinitely strong. Right. The more yeah. you hurt him and the more he, upset he gets, the stronger he is. And I feel, I felt like, one, they showed Hulk being weak against Iron Man in that movie, in uh, Age of Ultron 2 by get losing and then they don't show him being strong again like they just show him being weak again I don't know why they're nerfing his strength yeah. like he's supposed to be infinitely strong but like not always available because he's unpredictable yeah well I, I think part of their angle there with the uh, the Hulkbuster armor is if Bruce is supposed to have helped design this perhaps Bruce knew a way that he could actually be subdued as the Hulk so maybe you could use that as the justification of why Iron Man is able to finally subdue him in the Hulkbuster armor, because that was the entire intention of that, is to finally find something that could stop him. Why is there not, like, um, like sleeping gas that the suit emits, Ben? <laughs> yeah, that's stuff I had wondered about, too. Is like, could uh, You probably yeah. couldn't pierce his skin to drug him, but could you gas him sure, yeah. with something... And knock him out. But yeah. it was more interesting watching the, uh, the, the, the fist thing going through. It was like, go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep. Yeah. It was, it was very entertaining that way. Of course. And I loved that scene. Yeah. And then the, like, there's an hour left in the movie. Yeah. And well, I think, you know, the, you, as you were mentioning, it's like that, that's the big fight. And then it kind of comes down because you got to look at it. The Avengers are not always about the fight, although there is a pretty good fight there at the end. I did enjoy it, but it's more of a rescue mission. They're trying to get the people off of the city. And I, I think that's one of the things that's uh, the Marvel movies is going back to even the 2001 Spider-Man. Uh, the, I think they took a note from the old Christopher Reeve Superman where you actually get to see him, you know, save somebody, be a hero because you never saw Batman other than the animated series. But Batman in the movies, like the Tim Burton ones, he's he's a hero in the fact that he stopped these evil people from doing more harm. But he doesn't necessarily come to the rescue like Superman or Spider-Man or the Avengers where you get to see them coming and, and defending people and protecting sure, people. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what makes them more feel like a hero, and that's where people get behind. Uh, it's, uh, it's something I'm really glad they brought back with the Spider-Man movies is him coming to the rescue and you know getting yeah, kids yeah. out of the way of a truck in the second yeah. Spider-Man movie stuff totally. like that. Yeah, that's the I stuff agree. I love seeing in a good superhero movie is you know coming to the rescue once in a while. I actually liked the Amazing Spider-Man number one. Yeah, uh, because I felt that what they every time they had one of those like cliche moments where it's like. If he would just tell the girl the the truth, the problem would be over. They oh, they did. They would do it, and I like really, I really liked the movie for that reason. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like it didn't it uh, it didn't give itself like false conflict. Um, but then two just was yeah. Uh, the, I, the right, I still like two, but it might be just because I just love Spider Man so much that I was willing to accept it. Because I even even though th the worst Spider Man movie was definitely Spider Man three. Uh, I still have a little part of me that can watch it. All and producers still kind of enjoy fault. It. You can tell it. It's like, that movie is like you can just tell like producers got over involved in that movie. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, and it's I supposed think to be it, the vulture originally. Yeah, I would have loved to have seen that. And they were still talking about doing that for a fourth one. And you know, Sam Raimi was really kind of, of caving because everybody was crying out for a Venom, and he was not a fan of Venom. And so he kind of read up and he found an angle where he thought he could do it. And I have the uh, novelization. Sam Raimi wrote that with uh, one of his brothers and they just did their own version of Venom instead of going with what they could use from the comics to make Venom interesting. And there was a lot of Spider-Man fans and I, I kind of tend to agree with this and thinking, you know, you could have given Eddie Brock's story and built that up at the end and then had Venom in his own movie later. Is that way you could really, if you wanted to develop the character that far, because you could, that way you get to spend a movie maybe with Peter in the black costume and learning lessons of, wow, this thing is really doing horrible things to me. Uh, and, and, and still go with that. And then if you take out the whole concept of, oh, we decided the Sandman now is going to be the guy who actually shot your uncle. That, no, don't Ugh. change the origin story so of Spider-Man. Silly. What's the point? That just tells me that you didn't have a reason to have this bad guy. Yeah, you just didn't have <laughs> yeah. a reason. And you, you know, Thomas Hayden Church, I thought he was great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and there's I like enough, Topher. Yeah. I like Topher Grace too. I like I think I don't think it was the right character for him, but like I like Topher yeah, Grace. He, so. Yeah, he's a good actor, but maybe he this wasn't the perfect role for him. But I, I think they were trying too hard to make Eddie Brock a mirror image of Peter Parker in some fashion. Like he yes. was an opposite of Peter Parker. A hundred percent. Overconfident. Yeah. Yeah, and they were, but they failed in that. But boy, you know. did they ever fail! Are you, you going to go see the Deadpool movie? Uh, yeah, I think I'm going. I'm going to try to go hit it. I usually don't do R-rated movies myself, but uh, really, I, yeah, I, I, you know, because what you put into your brain comes out, and so I, I'm careful what I what I feed myself because I, you know, here it's 14A. Oh, it's oh really? Well, that's I guess that's helpful. Well, I don't know. We have a different rating game. system. We have yeah. uh, we have uh, G, PG, uh, 14A. 18A. Huh. So it might be not be that bad. So, but I, I do plan, I want to check it out because, you know, I'm not a big Deadpool fan, but I do have some comics like during the Civil War. Uh, and it was, he's a really funny character. And so I'm thinking, well, this could be a lot of fun to go. So Dead, Deadpool, a really great introduction to Deadpool is the um, Messiah Complex series. I've heard he, of that. He shows up later. Uh, and I think in the second, because there's three parts to it, um, and it's about cable traveling through time and they ru- end up running into um to Deadpool at the end of the like end of the universe it's pretty like Deadpool when he sh- like I don't know I think this is going to hopefully be really good and you g- will get a Deadpool 2 and hope and then hopefully um X-Force I think like yeah I know Ryan Reynolds really wants to get an X-Force going which I'd love to see Cable and Deadpool in a movie together. Yeah, that was the, I heard that's the plan for two and then three be should so be cool. X-Force. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. because it's R-rated, I can't give it a full review here on the Neverland podcast, uh, after I see it, uh, because, you know, I try to keep family friendly and try to recommend family friendly things, but I'm going to go check it out at least myself because I am curious enough to check it out. And I love the fact that they brought Colossus in because since they've, they've, within the X-Men films, they've teased a little, you get a little bit of Colossus, a little bit of Colossus. I want to see some full on Colossus stuff because he's a really good character. Yeah. Remember in the video game, I always used Colossus, that arcade video game, the X-Men arcade video game. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> oh, we're having, you know, oh. They came up with some really ridiculous powers for everybody to have. Like Wolverine had his weird claw lasers. <laughs> and the the one problem I also I had with some of the powers on the arcade game, since we're jumping everywhere, is Cyclops' eye beam would be like this tiny little blast. It was like you know it should be this big, pshoom, you know, big beam that goes across the screen, but it was always this little pew. Well, he can control it, right? Yeah. And but that's what I, that's all the visor does. Is it's like a like a filter. Yeah, but you know, if it's if it's supposed to be like your special move, and it's going to actually cost you a a, a something in the game. Yes, it needs right. to be this have, big kaboom. It should be like a screen clearing one. Yes, just let let him just unleash. Because Cyclops is always one of my pretty much my favorite X Men. Because I don't, I've always been drawn to the characters that they they take a responsibility the captain? for what they're doing. Yes, I love you like Leonardo. Leonardo. Oh yes, Leonardo of the Turtle. Okay, I yeah. had to catch up where we're at because yeah. my brain. Because Leon- Leonardo and Cyclops are like the same character. Yeah, yeah. And I, so I always kind of like that. I, I, I think I, you know, that Boy Scout complex maybe that I have in my head of you know always trying to do the right thing, be responsible, which is probably why I love Spider Man so much. One of I, the reasons. I agree with you. Like I was a big Leonardo. Like oh, I liked all the turtles, but yeah. Um, but I always love Leonardo. For me, I hate to say Cyclops because really? he was get he was getting in the way of Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> 
that doesn't surprise me. There's Wolverine, like this whole... Wolverine's the best Canadian superhero of all time, and ah, he's in the way. You know? I see what it is. Yeah, it's the Canada connection. Well, and he's just the coolest. Yeah, Wolverine's cool, but I can get tired of him pretty quick because really, he's he's kind of a jerk. Ah, uh, it's all how he's portrayed. Like yeah, I, that's... I like the thing is, is um, uh, I like. Uh, Hugh Jackman and stuff, but he's never portrayed Wolverine properly. Yeah, he shouldn't be this tall, good-looking guy. He because he really, when you see him in the comics, he's short. He's got really weird hair. He looks like this eighty-year-old man. That's he, he looks like dried bacon. You know, <laughs> everyone everyone points to the height and stuff. I I don't really care about that as much. Is more like actually how he portrays the character and the way he portrays the character. He like makes him goofy or like he t- make he like cracks wise all the time. Like he like does like, but. Like, it's the wrong kind of crack and wise. You know, if you, a good thing to do is watch, uh, if you like read some Wolverine comics or, you know, what, not even the 90s cartoon, because that's not even quite right, but he's more like Worf, where Worf is a very funny character in Star Trek, yeah. but he's not like cracking jokes all the time. He's funny because of his environment. Yeah. And, and how that's how Wolverine everything. is supposed to be. You yeah. know, he, you know, there's supposed to be funny moments because he's so serious, not because he like made a joke about you being a him being a can opener and you're a tin can or something, you know, like it's, yeah. it's some, they, they just don't portray it correctly. Which is uh, one of the things I thought was so fun with the, the ultimate Spider-Man comics they had uh, for a while. They had uh, Wolverine had gotten all shot up in like a diner and everything. And then uh, Spider-Man that well, I called it spider boy because it's, it was very much going back to a teenage Spider-Man, but it has Spider-Man actually trying to work with Wolverine and yeah. the typical, you know, Spider-Man banter. And he's, he, he, when he gets nervous, he cracks a joke. That's how he deals with being in life threatening situations. Yeah. So you got that and you've got, they're, the, always, they're always great together. Yeah. yeah. Because Wolverine, as you say, is, is always just very, very serious and like, yeah, kid, you gotta, you're going to just get in my way. I just, you you know, you, it's great stuff. Do you watch the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon? I tried. I it's tried. Really good. <laughs> it like doesn't start off very good, uh, and they kind of mess around with the Venom thing, it, which is which is fine. It's good, but I think it because basically what they did with Spider-Man, and that's how I think this is how they're going to portray him in the movies. Oh please no. <laughs> well, no, he's Deadpool for kids. Yeah, that's a, that's. I think the problem I've had with Ultimate Spider-Man is they played so much to kids wall. that I couldn't enjoy it. And uh, I don't know. I've been really they made him it. too silly, and because I loved like the '90s series that we were talking about before, he, he body swaps with Wolverine in it and stuff. Yeah, you know? that was like, fun because I, I, I did watch for yeah. a while, but it, it's gotten so silly. And they went, went Web Warriors, and you got Web you Warriors. Got too many, oh, I loved Web Warriors. You got too many cooks in the pot. So, you know, he Spider Ham having oh. him as. <laughs> Having him as part of a team where they put him with, you know, just basically to introduce characters, but having like Iron Fist and Pyro Man. But that's what, that's what, but that's what's going to happen. Like, this is the thing is like the whole thing is that they're going to make him this type of Spider Man. Yeah. And you know what I mean? Like, I, I like him better on his own with occasional team ups. Not, yeah. oh, look, oh, I'm of part course. of this whole team now because it, it, part of what makes Spider Man interesting is uh, it's a guy trying to have a normal life, but also having this responsibility as Spider Man. Of course. And the, the 90s series had that respect of him always having, you know, his normal life. And I loved the spectacular Spider Man. That was such a great show. It was so short lived. It was very sad, but I love the way they presented everything in the characters. And yeah, spectacular ultimate- Spider Man was really good. It, it it was a shame that it ended. It was so good. Uh, and I, for anyone who hasn't heard me talk to Greg Weissman, who was one of the creators of Gargoyles, he also was a producer on that show, and we did talk about that a bit. Love Gargoyles. Oh. Oh, Gargoyles was so good. Um, but it's Gargoyles Disney property. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Why Disney don't they do something brother? with that? Oh, um, my whole thing is that uh, my whole thing is I want them to ch- turn Toontown into '90s cartoon land. Basically. Yeah, I was just actually here at your your show for this week. I think yesterday. Yeah, when I was talking to uh, Fresh Slice, or yeah. Fresh, Fresh Slice, Fresh Big, Fresh Big Disney. Yes, yeah. great channel by the way. You've also mentioned th- uh, 360 degree attractions or whatever it is. I oh, yeah. SoCal attractions. Yeah, SoCal attractions. I do love yeah. watching their videos. By the way, great videos. I'm thinking about talking to some of these video makers and see if they will let me use their sound. On the, the show, just, you know, have the sound of the rides because I can't quite get all of them covered and, you know, give them a little plug. So I might partner with one of these video makers because they're doing such great stuff. Oh, great um, stuff. Um, but but uh, yeah, I'm losing my track of where my train of thought was going. 
<laughs> from like we're just talking. We're just you know what? We're just talking about movies, <laughs> TVs, yep. comic books. But, yeah, that's that's the problem I had with Ultimate Spider Man. I was like, yay, cool, another Spider Man series. And at that time, I had really enjoyed Avengers: Earth Mightiest Heroes. I love the way they handled the Avengers in that. It was great. So I was really excited about it. But then when I started watching Ultimate Spider Man, and it seemed they were being as silly as they could be with Spider Man, not really dealing with the fact that he's got to have a normal life that he's trying to maintain, but they made it just this team thing. And I, I know I just I slowly lost interest in it. Uh, and I was actually when Disney Infinity when they when they came around with Spider Man that they based it around that series. I was kind of disappointed. I was like, I want more, you know, the Spider Man that I grew up loving. Yeah, um, yeah, I I agree with you. Like, I I think College Spider Man is better. I do. Yeah. Like, I totally agree with you. But if I'm not gonna get that, then I'll take you know, what I can get. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So that's why I'm still excited to have Spider Man as part of the Marvel Universe. And, I, but I'm, I'm tired of him going back and making him a teenager every time. I, I know. I, yeah. But I feel like we have our adult superheroes and it, and it's okay that he is a teen, you know, and like we, they don't take those college versions of him away from us. Yeah. So we always you know, have it to go back to. And yeah. And, and like my four year old watches, the um ultimate spider-man that's kind of why i, I watch it and i don't know i think it plays well to him you know and i yeah. think for, you know, for for the younger audiences i think they've got a great show but for for and, you know, but the, the older the, the, people what like us maybe not so much but what they've hit on is that children this age love commentary right now yeah and instead of him instead of what he because he's cracking he, he always did this he cracked jokes and and he commented on what was happening but now he's more commenting to the reader or the watcher, and that's why I say like he, they've turned him into the like, Spider-Man is kid Deadpool now, <laughs> yeah, and, because he breaks the fourth wall, and you know like they'll change the animation style when he has like a cold or whatever, and <laughs> yeah, and, and, and but like it just speaks to the our the YouTube generation and 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 yeah. pe- the way we're going, and so I, I have no problem with them modernizing. You know, you know, Cap. You know, they've changed who Captain America is, and they've changed who Thor is, and um, that's what comics are supposed to do. That we're supposed to be comics are supposed to be a reflection of our society, and we use those metaphors to learn lessons and hopefully grow and improve from them. You know, and I, I, I feel like that that has to be in it, and, I, and that's the one thing. As I do feel like the movies at times lose that a little bit, and they tried with Age of Ultron, and and but I think they'll, I think it'll hit more of a note with Civil War. Civil War, I'm very excited for. Oh, I think yes. it's going to be really, really good. And Civil War was one of my favorite Marvel series uh, comic books. Yeah. Um, Although that, that was that was, but I don't know if downhill he, slide I, for Spider Man to me. I, I don't know if people are prepared. Well, they're not going to do that though. They're not going to do the reveal. They already yeah. said. Cause but, that, was, that that really, I mean, it was. I liked it was Iron so Spider. Interesting. I thought Iron Spider was a cool suit. Yes, so. it was. Um, Definitely, but, but it, 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 that was the beginning of. Oh, granted, it was interesting, you know, to see, you know, he, he basically broke his rule of, oh, I have to be able to keep everybody safe by not revealing and showing everybody put in danger. And then, of course, because they had made that grand mistake of having him reveal himself, they made a bigger mistake and wiping out all kinds of continuity of him being married. And then they decided, yeah. you know, they break it some more by having him swap with Dr. Octopus. And I know a lot of people enjoyed it, but I, I was irritated with that idea. And now they've even really I, well, messed it up by liked, turning him into Tony I liked, Stark. I like Superior Spider-Man. But. I know a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, but yes, he is Tony Stark did. now. Yeah, he's Tony uh, Stark it, yeah, now. It's a, yeah, I got bored of them. I so, like them to start off with, but I got bored of them. The Doctor Strange comics right now are phenomenal, though. Yeah, and if anyone has, I think I need to look into yeah. it. You, oh, they're, they're only five issues in. They are so good, and they'll make you so excited for the movies. Um, it, just in case I wasn't already. <laughs> yeah. Well, but yeah, it might give you some more context to enjoy the movie. But yeah. Civil War is going to be good. I just don't know if people are prepared to have Tony Stark be the bad guy. And unless uh, they actually agree with some of the things he does. Well, yeah, then they might. You know. That is one thing with the Marvel Civil War that I, I liked it about it is they if you saw how I, it started, I, you could understand Tony Stark's point of view. Well, you can understand his point of view, but mm-hmm. understanding someone's point of view usually still means you think they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, but I, I totally understood. And your the, wife's the, like, the, I understand your point of view, but do the dishes. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah that's the, still, the problem with the registration so. is that it was going to literally have to be having enforced like that. 
to where, oh, if you're not going to comply with it, we're going to go after it and have to lock you up on something. That's where they really went wrong. But I think having the idea of, of like, hey, you know, maybe we should have and encourage you to train to make sure you are fully prepared to go out there and do your superhero stuff and and maybe not have this much of a level of an accident that wiped out an entire school. And that's where I think Spider-Man fits in again, right? That Ultimate Spider-Man is all about him training young Super young heroes to be better, right? Sure. Um, you can look at it that way. Yeah, yeah. But that's kind of how I see how he might fit in, where he, you know, he can be that like example for young people to. Because we're not going to exist in. A, it's not going to like. There's going to be no registration or something. There's, you know, there's going to be something that, and there's no Iron Man movies coming out. So Iron Tony Stark might end up like still. There might be. You might have your different Avenger movies. Yeah, I'm thinking some West Coast Avengers is getting started. So, <laughs> but uh, we probably better wrap this up. We've been going a long time. Oh my, I'm sure we could keep going for another hours if we had that kind of time. But unfortunately, we don't. No, but, I wish I could. I, I, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll make an effort to come back on, and I'll make sure to uh, not derail you uh, <laughs> next time. And we'll plan a time where I can can uh, don't have to go make dinner quickly. <laughs> oh well, we can chase rabbits all day if we want to. That's fine, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, but once again, you can be found at DCast, and I and your website is thedcast.com, correct? Yeah, so you can, um, I'm Dale Wentland, uh, D A L E W E N T L A N D, uh, at Dale Wentland on the Twittergram, the Twittergram, Twittergram. on Instagram and the Twit, the tweets, and, uh, <laughs> It's the Decast uh, at the Decast on Twitter, the Decast.com as our website and our YouTube channel. And we put out a podcast every Monday. We just had Fresh Baked on. We've interviewed Super Carlin Brothers twice. We've had um, one half of Thingamavlogs, Leo and Sarah. Uh, and then we usually um, talk about what's happening on the YouTube world, but mostly focused on Disney, Marvel, Star Wars, and Pixar movies. And me and Andy, uh, we talk. Basically like this for about an hour. <laughs> yeah. So pretty much if you enjoy the Neverland podcast, you're going to like them too. Cause we're, we do a lot of the same things. <laughs> yeah. We love the same stuff. I just, I occasionally cheat and go and talk about He-Man or something too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get in trouble every time I do that. I'm br- I brought up a one punch man. Um, <laughs> And it, it got it, – Andy was like, well, so what do you mean? Like it's a comic book? I'm like, no, it's a manga <laughs> <laughs> and an animated sh- movie. It should take TV show. It's 12 episodes. But anyways, whoever anyone's listening, they should go watch One Punch Man because it's phenomenal. Yeah. I'm going to have to go check that out just because I'm sure I probably would like it. It's, it just sounds fun. One Punch Man. Oh, it's great. Uh, it's, it's great for people who love anime and great for people who don't like anime. Uh, and uh, Leo Camacho and I talk about it on Twitter sometimes when we're watching it. <laughs> okay. Okay, I almost forgot though, before we sign off, because you love to do movie theories. Yeah. I have now determined, because Marvel is printing Star Wars comics, that the Star Wars universe is now part of the Marvel universe, at least in the cinematic universe, and I guess part of the Marvel universe in comics as well, because they have the comics. But it happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, so maybe it didn't interact so much, except for perhaps the building of Death Stars. Yeah. So planet consumers. Yeah. So if they keep making the Death Stars bigger and bigger and bigger, maybe the First Order creates Galactus. Dun dun dun. (laughs) The ultimate planet destroyer, Galactus. Yeah. And Snoke becomes the Watcher (laughs) or something. (laughs) Maybe he is a Watcher. Maybe he is. Maybe he is the Watcher. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe Mm. it becomes Luke. Ooh. Scary stuff. Scary stuff. All right, well, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Neverland Feedback. Okay, I have a really fun piece of feedback that I wanted to share with you. Uh, This was shared on the Neverland page on Facebook, the like page. And it's from Jeffrey Fishbach, and he says, Here at work, listening to episode 115, and just wanted to let you know, Jeremy, that yes, KB Toy Stories, stores, I guess he's what he meant, he put stories. <laughs> well, when you say toy, you obviously you want to say story right afterwards, right? Uh, but anyways, KB Toy Stores were all over. We had a copy here in my area of Pennsylvania back in the day. I got most of my Kenner Star Wars toys there. Well, there and Sears. 
Uh, so, yeah, I figured there was KB toy stores everywhere because uh, I've seen some other photos like, hey, do you remember KB toys? But uh, I don't think my wife has ever seen one anywhere else. Uh, so that's why she was the one that's like, do they even have them anywhere else? And I figured there was. So, But thank you, Jeff, for letting us know that you used to like to shop at one. Uh, I worked at one here uh, seasonally, locally, and then uh, the seasonal store did so well at a, a local mall that the, the mall is pretty much non-existent anymore. But the seasonal store went so well that they did give us a permanent store, and I was actually working at that KB KB Toy Store when the toys for Episode One, you know, Star Wars: The Phantom Menace, came out, and I remember being really excited to go and seeing all the new toys and getting a look at it and everything, and having no idea that everybody was going to end up hating Jar Jar, but we knew Darth Maul looked really awesome. So yeah, that is our feedback for the week. Now I have a mission for you guys: some feedback that I want to hear about. I'm working on kind of a special and a weird and fun kind of wacky episode that's still upcoming and i want to hear from you on some of the oddball star wars items that you used to have collect uh you know like board games uh i'm i I heard a fun story over at techno retro dads and i'm going to contact one of them to have him tell us about some fun things he used to do with his star wars toys that's kind of off the wall but yeah share those weird star wars memories for weird things that you remember having you know bed sheets or whatever something something that's not the normal thing of like you know toys or video games but, you know, did you have a particular Star Wars board game? Uh, what were your memories of playing it? Stuff like that. Because there's always been kind of goofy board games out there. But I want to hear about it. Get in contact with me. Record an audio if you can. And um, if you need to share it to, with me via Dropbox, that's that works out great. Or you can try to send it via email, podcast at neverlandpodcast.com. And don't forget that at our website, you can fill out an entire form to just tell me about it via email. I have a whole contact page now. Or it makes it a lot easier to just send an email that way. Alrighty, but that's going to wrap things up. I hope to hear from you all all about your fun Star Wars memories, and make sure you come back next week. Thank you for listening to the Neverland Podcast. We invite you back next week for more fun and adventure. Until then, remember to keep a pixie in your pocket. It's that young at heart, positive attitude that you can share with others. And remember to visit our website at NeverlandPodcast.com. There you can find links to our news page, a link to visit our shop, and much more. And please feel free to leave us a voicemail at 816-226-6492. Or email us at podcast at neverlandpodcast.com. If you email us a Lost Boy or Pixie nickname with a reason why you chose that name, you can become an official Neverlander. Girls are too clever to get lost, so we are naturally magical pixies. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at NeverlandPCast. And like our Neverland Podcast fan page on Facebook. We also have a group on Facebook for you to join. We also appreciate your support in keeping the Neverland Podcast up and running. Visit patreon.com slash neverlandpodcast to donate to keeping the pixie dust alive. Copyright content featured on the Neverland Podcast is copyright of their respective creators and used under fair use license. All original content is copyright of Blue Band Productions. God God bless. bless! Introducing Carvana Value Tracker, where you can track your car's value over time and learn what's driving it. It might make you excited. Whoa, didn't know my car was valued this high. It might make you nervous. Uh Uh-oh, market's flooded. My car's value just dipped 2.3%. It might make you optimistic. Our low mileage is paying off. Our value's up. And it might make you realistic. Mm, Car prices haven't gone up in a couple weeks. Maybe it's time to sell. But it will definitely make you an expert on your car's value. Carvana Value Tracker. Visit Carvana.com to start tracking your car's value today.